you have your Bible, open to Luke chapter 14. Uh, as Christina uh, mentioned, we are starting a new series today. And as the bumper video uh, suggested, it is uh, titled Radical. And um, today we're going to be talking about a radical commitment to Jesus. Um, when you look at Jesus, like this is, uh, there's a lot of opinions about Jesus out there in the world, wouldn't you say? Right? There's, but when you really begin to read and study Jesus and who he was and in his context and what he talked about and what he invited people into, um, and, and furthermore, what he did, and then also the response that people had to Jesus, one of this, these, this principle really just sort of rises up that Jesus is, um, is radical. His message is radical. The result of uh, his existence in people's life and as a result of his ministry was, was radical. And uh, when you kind of convey the fact that Jesus was a radical and, you know, he, uh, he formed, you know, us, the church, you know, we are, the church is his disciples who, you know, follow after him. So if Jesus is radical, he's our model for discipleship, then the church really ought to be anything but boring, Right? I mean, it should, should be anything but status quo. Our, our lives and our existence is a, it's a radical existence. This was, this was the result of, you know, the, the ascension. After Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended, uh, the, the disciples, they sort of had, you know, one of two options. They either could, like, you know, cower and hide and, you know, scurry around in the darkness, uh, or uh, what what actually did happen, the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they, they actually, they got, they got crazy, bold, radical people is what they became. Like they, they just, they, they transformed from this, this cowering group of people to this group of people who just were not afraid uh, to go and do the kingdom work that Jesus sent them on. Uh, in Acts chapter four, you see this, this really incredible scene where they're, um, in, in context, they're facing the, the violent persecution of the religious establishment and even the Romans. Uh, so it wasn't just one group of people who were trying to hunt these people down, but it was two groups of people. Uh, it was, uh, you know, you could say Temple Inc. and it was state uh, that were trying to eradicate this group of people. And uh, here they're in a room and in Acts 4, what you find is that they're praying for boldness. They, they ask the Lord for boldness to go out and, and to, to preach the gospel, to live their lives as gospel-shaped people and that Jesus would be with them and that uh, signs and wonders and healings and miracles would happen as a result of the name of Jesus going forth. That's a, like, that's a, that's a radical existence. Uh, and then you know, a couple chapters later, one of the things that you see is Peter... Um, and a complete reversal, you know, early on in Acts, you see Peter who is, you know, again, hiding in kind of a dimly lit room with a whole bunch of other of Jesus' disciples. And uh, now in Acts chapter 5, he's like, he's out in the broad daylight. And as he's walking out and throughout the, the streets in the broad daylight, it says his shadow, his shadow, so I have a kind of a big shadow right here in front of me. As a shadow crossed over people, uh, they, were, they were healed, through the power of God. And, and I read that and I go, well, that's not ordinary, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, that's the, that's the, the type of life that, that Jesus actually invites us into. I mean, you can justify like why that doesn't happen, but that is, that is you know, the, the invitation that Jesus offers his first disciples, when he says, hey, come and follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men, he, he still offers to us today. But we, we sort of just kind of like, well, let's, let's dumb it down a little bit so we don't look like fanatics. You know? But the reality is that when you look at the, when you look at the message in the life of Jesus, it's It's radical. It is. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to, we're going to look at this. Um, and today I'm going to start with one of the most radical things that Jesus uh, would say about his disciples. And so if you're in your Bible, uh, Luke chapter 14, uh, 
You can read along with me. Uh, Verse 25 says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned to them and said, Now, pause right there. In our world, it is, it is really easy to, to gather a crowd, right? It is. I mean, there's, there's, it's amazing to me. There are, uh, there are apps that you can, you can download, and you can, you can actually send a bot out across the internet to gather followers. Like it, you, can, you can download an app that will get you millions and millions and millions of people following whatever social media you're on. And, and that's, that's like you can do it at a click of a button, right? And, and this is like everything that Jesus is going to say here sort of falls into that. That you can, you know, there are lots of people who are following Jesus. The Gospels, you know, they, they actually point to this fact. Mark does a very interesting uh, aspect with the crowd that Mark sort of puts the crowd in sort of an oppositional perspective of, of Jesus's ministry. But, but Jesus, Jesus attracted massive crowds. And there were people who were just really like enamored with what he was doing. I mean, there was a guy walking around raising the dead and casting out demons. I mean, there's like, that sort of like turns the head and draws the attention of people, right? It, it, It does today, it certainly would today, and it certainly did in the first century. And so Jesus is walking around doing radical stuff, and there's all these people who are coming out of the woodwork who are hearing his message, and they're like, wow, we gotta follow this guy, and we gotta we gotta stay with this guy. But Jesus, Jesus understood what we understand today, that just because you have a crowd doesn't necessarily mean that they're really on board with who you are. In the, the world of social media, you can, get a, you can get a million followers, but that doesn't mean that any one of those million people are really paying attention to what it is that you're posting. You ever get an invite from like somebody you don't know and you're like, who is this person? And then you like pull up their profile. It's like, wow, they've got 4 million followers. How'd they do that? Who is this person? I've never heard of them. But they just bought them all. That's what they did. Anyway. Jesus, before he goes further in talking about what it means to be a disciple, he wants to, he wants to make it crystal clear to the crowd that, hey, following me in the midst of the, 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 the mass group of people to watch what I'm doing and to hear what I'm saying is not equivalent to actually truly becoming my disciple. Many people are really, really great at gathering a crowd, but not so much at discipling people. And just because you have a large crowd doesn't necessarily mean you have a church. That's how that tra- verse translates to the New Testament. So in verse 26, Jesus, and this is, the, this is where he gets radical. This is the verse that nobody wants to talk about. Okay? I'm going to talk about it because I'm not afraid of it. But this verse at face value, you're like, wait a minute, did Jesus really say that? And this is what he says. If anyone comes to me... And he does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and scissors. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I know what you're thinking. Jesus, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, even if this is the first time you've ever heard anything preached from the gospel today, probably likely, um, you know, the cultural expectations that Jesus, didn't you preach love? Right? I mean, that's like the, the universal, you know, accepted fact about Jesus that the world just sort of like knows is that Jesus was a peaceful person and he taught us to love one another. But doesn't this look like the opposite? This is why people are afraid of this passage. Because you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. This passage contradicts the, the, the accepted fact about Jesus that he taught us to love people. And here he is, he's telling me to hate my mother and my father and my brother and my sister and my grandfather and my grandma. And how can you hate your grandmother? But he's telling me to hate my, you know, he's telling me to hate my whole family. This is, this is complete bonkers. It's bananas. It's what it is. Like Jesus is so, it's like he's off topic. Like, it's like somebody like take his microphone. He's, you know. Here's the, here's the truth. In the English, the English kind of does this, this passage a disservice. Because uh, the word, 
The word for love, well, one of the words for love in the Greek is this word agapeo. Uh, There's another word that means love, and that's phileo. And phileo is more of like a, you know, it's like a brotherly love. It's intimate. It's um, uh, laying down life. It expresses um, way more about how you love somebody than just sort of a general love. It actually communicates uh, motives and feelings and emotions. The other word, agapeo, is the word that sort of doesn't, you know, actually emits in the Greek. It emits this um, this context of an emotion and uh, a feeling. And what it really does is sort of just kind of like, you know, phrase things as though um, the way we use love in the sense that we love tacos, right? We, we agapeo tacos. We don't phileo tacos. If you phileo taco, you've got a problem, okay? So, Understanding that, so the opposite, the opposite of agapeo would be meseo. And this is the word that Jesus uses for hate here. It is actually not really kind of like a carnal hate where we have an intense emotion against our, our brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. He's not, he's not saying that. But actually what he's saying is that uh, Maseo, as the opposite of agapeo, it carries sort of the same context, but it's just opposite. It's, it's the, the antithesis of. And so what you're, he's, he's saying is that in your life, in your family, uh, you're not, those, those love feelings and emotions, those, they're not being transitioned to hate feeling and emotions. But what is happening is your, your attitudes and your you know, priorities and your motivations and your, your, your values, the, the, everything you sort of you think about your family, all of that's changing. It, it's no longer the highest priority in your life. In order to be my disciple, actually, Jesus is saying, take your family and you got to knock them down a notch and you got to put me here. That's, that's what he's saying. Now, this would have been really radical in the first century world. Um, and actually, there's parts of the world right now, this is, um, this is, this is relevant information. If you actually come from a, a sort of a collectivist culture, some of you very international um, you know, people uh, amongst us, uh, you come from parts of the world that, that sort of still have this value where you get a sense of identity from your family. And, and this is the way the first century world worked. Like this is, this is why when you read the Bibles, you see lots of sons of. Sons of this, sons of that, sons of dot, dot, dot. Right? You see lots of sons. And the reason you see lots of sons is because as a first century person, you got your identity from your family or from your grandfather. Even, even today, you, you know, the parts in the Middle East, they still walk around and they still talk about, you know, when you walk into a shop, you, you, you'd say, I'm Caleb. I'm, uh, well, you wouldn't say that. I'd say, I'm the son of Doug. And Doug, Doug would planted a church. And, and Doug, did all of these things. And you know, so what you would do to actually introduce who you are is you talk about your family. And so that was, that was so, like Jesus is saying is so radical because he's basically saying, look, as, as, your, as your personhood certainly exists in this world, you're no longer identifying yourself according to the family. You're identifying yourself according to me. You're you're not you're not gonna walk into you know the 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 store and say well I'm you know the son of Doug you're gonna say Jesus is my my Lord it's a it's a reprioritization and this is this is what this is what Jesus does in our lives and discipleship to Jesus actually entails it's a it's a radical reorientation of every aspect of our life including. Our family. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own 
mother and father and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. In other words, your family, your family can become an idol that's on a pedestal higher than Christ. And he's, he's, not, he's not calling us to mistreat our family. What he's, he's calling us to do is let, let his, his life living in and through us influence through faith and demonstrations of faith and love and care influence how we interact with our family. But no longer you know, does our family become the highest priority. Jesus is first the highest priority. And him in the seat the highest seat influences all the other things. Moving on. Verse 27, Jesus says, so whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. So the first, the first thing he asked, he, the first aspect that he tackles is, is, our, is our relationships, right? Our, our, our family and our, our friendships and the, the, the relationships that we have in this world. All of those things through discipleship with Jesus, they, they come under the authority of Christ. Jesus is raised up. Now when he moves on to this next thing, um, we... We know, I mean, if you've been in church long enough, uh, you, know, you know about the cross, right? And uh, you know about the death. And if you've ever been to church on Easter, you know about the, the death and the resurrection of, of Christ. And you know that he died on a cross. Um, now, we know that because of history. But put yourself in the, the context of a, of a first century person, right? So Jesus is talking to a crowd. You know, you're a, you know, let's just say you're, you know, a poor farmer from Galilee. Uh, you only know when, like, you hear the term cross, you only know that cross through one reference, and that is the Roman system of execution. You know, we, looking back through history, we have a context for the cross. We go, oh, well, yeah, that's the Roman context of, 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 you know, that's the Roman, you know, method of execution, uh, and that was how Jesus died. And that was, you know, the, you know, after that he, you know, was raised to life, and then the ascension happened, and and you sort of have this this post this post, uh, you know, resurrection context of everything. But if you put yourself into the the seat of the the early, uh, you know poor Galilean farmer who's hearing Jesus talk about a cross, you don't have the context of anything that happens after his death. Actually, you don't even have any f interest in knowing anything about, uh, well, actually, you, have, you, you really don't believe that Jesus is going to be arrested. You actually have this view that Jesus is going to take the highest seat. He's going to restore the kingdom. That was the expectation. That's actually why the crowds followed him. But anyway, I digress. Um, what they knew of the cross, and this is, this is why Jesus' words for them would have been, again, so very radical, is because here he is talking about a system that existed in the world that was of the, the most violent ways that any person could die. And, and furthermore, what what happened before that person was put on the cross or they were hung up on the cross, they, were, they, they knew that the Romans, you know, after their, their trial, they would, they would put that cross on their back and they would carry, the person would be forced to carry that cross all the way through town. And everybody, because, you know, I, I'm always just amazed why this was sort of a spectacle that it was. All throughout history, executions are, are a spectacle. I don't know why. Um, but the whole town would gather and watch as that person carried their sins, their death sentence all the way. And so the cross, the cross for, for Jesus' crowd was, it was a, it was a mark of, of going to one's death. 
And he's, he's basically saying at this point that uh, my following me, following me is, is the ultimate act of self-denial. It's the, it's, it is the, you are willingly taking up your cross to follow in my ways. You are putting all of the things in your life that give you a sense of personhood, you are putting all of those things to death to follow me. You're doing it willingly. You're, you're going to, and this, this life is gonna be like carrying the cross where you know, for, for the sake of righteousness, you're gonna go out before the community and all of the people of the earth are gonna come out and they're gonna look at you like, like what did that person, what did that person do? They're gonna look at you with a sense of shame. They're gonna look at you like you're, you're, you're counterculture, that you are, you are bonkers. And this is what following Christ means because there's, you know, and, and all of us, we do have a cross. And at, at times the cross looks, looks really different. But ultimately, it comes down to a, a sort of a self-denial type of thing, a, a laying down our life for other people, a laying down our life for, for the cause of the kingdom. Other people look at it as, you know, those outside the kingdom turn their head and sort of go, Well, that's interesting. Like you're sort of going to your death. And it, it sort of manifests like this, that um, your boss, I, I, once, I once had a, a boss, not here, not here. Um, definitely not here. Um, I once had a boss that actually uh, came in my office one day and there was like this inventory shortage and basically asked me to change numbers. Oh, no, you didn't report that. You, you didn't see that report. Just put this number. And I'm like, now, at the time, I was, I was 19 years old. And I was like, uh, I don't know. Something about that just seems kind of wrong. And uh, several times they, they told me, hey, you got you to gotta change. You actually got to change that number. That's not the right number. And I'm like, but I, but I counted that number. <laughs> That's, that's the number you're telling me to enter is not the number that I tell you that we have. And so we got in this really long sort of debate. Um, and I, I just, I, I finally said, like, this is, this is wrong. For me as a person, this is wrong. And, and to them, they sort of looked at me like, well, no, this is just normal practice here. This is what we do. And I say, yeah, but, but this, is, this shows a lack of integrity, this is, this is not who I am as a person. And that's what it, it looks like. So in, in some aspects, you know, carrying a cross can be a, like, a, like I'm, not gonna, I'm, not gonna cho- I'm not choosing to enter into some sort of corrupt way of being. I'm actually rejecting the corruption of the world. And I'm choosing, I'm choosing to live for righteousness. I'm choosing to live... Uh, according to the, the, the morality of God rather than the morality of the world. It's, it's just how we're different. I, I, uh, one, one day uh, I was at this job and I was sitting outside and I was reading my Bible and it, was, it had this, this really nice place to sit and, and nice good shade. And I was out there reading my Bible one day and this guy comes out and um, he definitely was living an alternative lifestyle for me, just completely different. And, and he looks at me and he goes, oh, you're, you're one of those. And I go, I don't know what those you're referring to, but I think if you knew the Jesus that I knew, you'd, You'd want to be loved by him. And that acts for him, that started a whole long conversation about just, you know, changing the, shifting his paradigm of what he thought Christians were. And actually, when I left that job, it was, it was um, really interesting. He goes, you know, um, he goes, some, like, as, as a person who's sort of anti-Christian, I just want you to know that um, 
Like there's Christians out there that don't represent anything of what I think Jesus represents, but you, you're different. And I think you represent who Jesus actually is. And I appreciate that about you. That's, that's carrying the cross. That's, you know, it's, it's looking at, okay, all right, Jesus, this is Jesus's main mission. And I'm, I'm getting my life in line with his mission, with what he's doing. And in, in the context of, of Luke, Jesus is going to the cross. The, his followers don't know this. But the early church that's reading this six decades later, they would have understood what Jesus was up to. And they, as we do today, they would have had history informing what Jesus was saying. But for the, his, his early followers, the crowd that was present, he was telling them, look, you need to understand that this, this way of living I'm, I'm I'm calling you into, that I'm inviting you into, it is a come and die sort of deal so that you can live, but you cannot be my follower unless you are ready to lay down all of the things, all of the trappings of this world. You need to set them aside. Following Jesus really is the reprioritization of everything. It's, it's knowing what, what, what becomes subservient to the life that Jesus has really called me to live. And he's called all of us to live a very dynamic sort of existence. He, that's the, the, the existence of his, his disciples was, was very dynamic, now ask yourself the question, look at your life versus what you know about the early disciples of Jesus. Is there a variance? And if there's a variance, then die. <laughs> put it on the cross, put the cross on your back and go and die and say, you know what? I'm gonna change for you, Jesus. He goes on in verse 28, he says, for which of you, and he kind of makes this digression, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Whether he has enough to complete it, right? That would be stupid. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus sort of gives this, this parable here that he goes, look, understand like knowing what I'm calling you to here first and foremost before you actually say yes I want you to know up front and and consider what this is going to cost your life and if you don't have what it takes to to complete the task to truly follow me then Jesus is saying look people are gonna they might mock you this is sort of just kind of Crazy, if you can't say yes, don't follow me. That's what Jesus is saying. He goes on to say, for what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able to with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. So one side, this guy goes out to war. He's going up against 20,000 with his 10,000. And when he realizes it, what he has to do is he has to send a delegation and ask for terms of peace. And he finally says this, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. And so in essence, what Jesus is saying is, look, a yes to me is going to radically reorient your life. To say yes to me, it just, it, it's, a, it's a radical change. It's a radical transformation that, that changes everything that you know. It takes your whole life and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna put it into context and, and and beneath a new Lord is what you're going to do. And that, that Lord is going to is gonna change how you see all of those things. And that's our, that's our life as believers. You know, actually, here... Take this. This is, you know, good flashlight. This flashlight, this is, this is our life as believers. This flashlight doesn't work without a battery, right? Like, anybody have a battery life flashlight like this? These are, these are great. I just got this. Um, 
And this is essentially what, what Jesus is saying is that, look, in this world, there's lots of things that you think are going to power this battery. To be, my, to be my true disciple, to live exactly as I created you to live, is going to take something other than what you have. It's going to take another component. And so this is, this is what we, we do in life, right? This is, you know, we, we, start, we start searching for things that can, you know, power the flashlight, right? And so the first, the first thing we try, this is, this is what, what I remember trying at some point in my life, is, is you, you get this little guy, the AAA battery, right? And this, this sort of represents, well, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, like, I'm going to go back to church, Right? And and you go, I'm gonna go back to church. But you know, nothing too serious. I'm I'm just I'm gonna start going to church. And so uh one of the things you you do is you know, you you like you I'm gonna this little guy represents I'm just gonna add God to my life, right? But but not on his terms. I I'm gonna add God on my terms. And so you take the very smallest possible portion of God that you can you can get and you just sort of try and add him to your life and you're wondering, man, this just doesn't seem to be working. And so then what you do is you go, all right, well, you know, maybe I just need a little bit more God, right? So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to add another, you know, service. Uh, so let's go Sunday, and maybe I'll just add another Bible study. Oh, and you lose it. <laughs> and that doesn't work. Oh, thank you, Wednesday. It's right behind you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. I'll need that for later. My remote control is missing batteries. Um, then what you do is you, like other people try this. They, they have their life. They know, man, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a void in my life. And, and I, I go, I'm going to, you know, let's, let's see if we can power that up. And so what you do is you, you find the sort of the, the, the most, what I call the most aggravating battery in all of the world. Do you know why I hate this battery? Smoke alarms. Is it just me, or does other, do other people have a problem actually identifying which smoke alarm the battery is going out of? Yeah, me. So this, I hate these batteries. Plus, like, you know, as kids, we used to you know, do that. Anybody do that? Ooh, I still, I, I'm not sure why they've never fixed that. Like in, in the, the, the 21st century where there's warning labels on everything, there's not a warning label on this battery that says, do not stick your tongue on this. It's weird. But, but let's, call this, let's call this battery like the, the synthetic, you know, sort of battery. Like, so we are looking in life to... to all of the different things, right? All of the, the vices, the, the substances and the alcohol and the drugs and the things that we can sort of just try, like, oh, well, we think it fits here, and, but, but it never actually really connects, does it? And, and then, then what happens is, you know, after a certain period of time, the battery dies and it just begins to, you know, create, you know, havoc in your life because all you hear all night long is beep, beep, right? Yeah, that's, so there you go. So so our, so so what happens is people begin to look for things that they can go. All right, let's do this. And so maybe maybe that's maybe that's you here today. You're like, oh, I need God. And so you're you know trying to to take a little bit of this, but you know what? You're not willing to to let go of your vices and give those up and recognize that hey, there's a there's a there's a problem in my life, and I need to I need to actually ditch that battery. So that I can begin finding the one that really does fit. That's what people do. And then, you know, here's, here's the, next, the next iteration, right? So back to the round ones. Back to the, the normal thing. Like, okay, all right, there's a hole in my life. I need, I need something to power this. I need some sort of thing. And so um, they think, well, you know, God is, God is a little, you know, he's a little outside of my box. Um, but you know what? I, I guess I'm going to, I'll just be... I'll be a good person, right? That's all it takes. I can be a good person. I don't really need Jesus. You know, God is sort of, you know, funny anyway. And, uh, you know, his people are kind of strange. And I don't want to be like that. But I can be a good person and I can still have, you know, this thing that's missing in my life there. 
and they, they sort of attach a thing, and then they, they go, well, that's not really working, and so, you know, they, they sort of make an argument of, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to help somebody. So not only am I a good person, but I'm also, I'm also a helpful person. I'm a moral person. I'm a good person. But the only problem with this is that who is really good? Who? Right? I mean, good is a, throughout all of history, has been a, a, a shifting standard throughout the world. I mean, 200 years ago in, in our, our country, to, to be a good Christian was sort of like, oh, well, I'm, you know, going to own, own people. I'm going to own slaves. And that was, a, that was a moral standard of goodness. And now we look back and go, wait a minute, that's not, that's not good. It's not at all good. Mistreating people, people treating people like animals, like that's, like, like livestock, that's, that's terrible. That's not good. So really, again, who among us is really good, right? So these batteries, those batteries don't work. They really don't. And then we go, all right, well, let's, uh, you know, let's find this, this real hole, right? So the real hole, you know, takes a bigger battery, right? And this is sort of the pursuit of becoming the, the apex predator in the world, this is the, the, the top of the food chain. This is, this is the top of the corporate ladder. This is where you have arrived and you go, okay, well, let, this, is, this is that. That does a better job of filling that gap. But ultimately, and if you've ever been in that position where you've reached the top, the pinnacle of your career, what you hoped to find in that spot doesn't really add up, does it? No. You could be the CEO of a corporation. You could be starting your own business. You could be taking off. And, and everything that you hoped to exist in that space really isn't there. You can say, oh, man, I've got all of these degrees. I've, I've got the MBA. I've got the, the two other master's degrees. I've just finished my doctoral degree. And one of the things that you find after all of that pursuit, you go, what I hoped to be there just doesn't add up does it and so after you're there you go what I need is a bigger battery let's do the D cell this is the this is the mother of all batteries and you go that's that and this 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 accounts for stuff is what this accounts for it's just stuff you know and and stuff stuff isn't bad you know personally I having a car that could drive 150 miles an hour excites me it does. It really does. Amen. Thank you. I, I'll take that as an affirmation. I've only got to afford one. Can we take up an offering? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. So, so this is like, well, you know, if I just had you know, a bigger house, you know, another car, more motorcycles, more, more stuff, bigger boat, it, you know, that'll, that'll, that'll fill the gap. But it doesn't quite power the battery, does it? And so you got to go, that one doesn't work. It's just the pursuit of things. And then this is what other people do is like they go, um, all right, I see the problem, right? You know, this is a sort of, you know, square peg, round hole type of situation. But this, this as much as you, you want that thing to fit in there, what this represents is, is a people making Christ into what they sort of want it to be. This is, this is a, a, a pseudo-Christianity that's just sort of, you know, like, you know, a knockoff. You, you, take, you take the goodness of Jesus, but yet you sort of like lop things off of, of the whole thing. And you go, oh, I don't really need to do all that stuff. And that, you know, just, you know, the, you, in the end, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. It's a battery, it matches the voltage, but it doesn't, it doesn't fit. It's a, it's a Christianity of your own making. It's ultimately Christianity on your terms. It's a counterfeit. It's not the real thing. What is the real thing is this guy right here. And this, this is Christ who fits. Right? And you see the light. And as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 
Let this light shine before all men so that they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the discipleship that Jesus calls us to. This is what radical discipleship looks like. It's being empowered by the person of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the goodness of God to do his bidding in the world. Amen? Let's stand. In this life, C.S. Lewis said it the best. There is a, there is a, a longing in our heart that, that nothing in this world could satisfy except for the person of Jesus Christ. We will look and we will look and we will look and at the end of our life, well, one of the things we'll find is that that, that thing we searched at high and low for, it, it's not to be found on this earth. It's in, it's in heaven. It's sit, it's, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. His name is Jesus Christ. And the, the, only, the only thing that, that we can do to receive is to open our hearts and to commit Jesus I want to follow you. I, I want to follow you. I don't want to follow anything but the real you. I want to, I want to give my life to a, the Jesus of the Bible, the, the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount. As, as difficult as, as that may be to understand, what you need to know is that it, it takes it takes acceptance and followership of, of the person of Jesus, but it also takes the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Jesus, this is, this is the thing you need to know about, about Christ. And even if you think, you look, at, you look at Christianity or the church as just sort of this in, impossible sort of existence that you can never attain. Jesus never invites us into anything that he doesn't empower. He invites us into a life, into a followership that he provides the energy for. And all we have to do is say, yes, Jesus, I follow you. Yes, Jesus, I believe. I believe in your word, in your goodness, in your kindness, in your faithfulness, in your sacrifice for my life. You're laying down so that, Lord, I could become a new person and that your spirit could empower my change and begin filling that void and begin satisfying that part of my life that I've been searching for. We thank you, Lord, for being with us, for giving your life for us, for making possible what it is that you invite us into. Help us, Lord, just to, to live such radical existence that, Lord, when you, you come walking up the beach and ask for us to follow you, that, Lord, we, we do truly drop everything and come after you. Let us be that type of people. So in Jesus' name we pray. We, we just thank you for his presence here today. Amen.